welcome back so we are going to resume our discussions and we are going to consider another uh, uh, classification of microcontrollers or microprocessors and this one is called instruction set architecture as the term suggests the classification the types of microprocessors are often classified in the way the instructions are uh, designed for a given microprocessor now to understand that let us uh, uh, first of all describe what are instructions and all that now what are you going to write in the memory uh, of the uh, microprocessor is a program and what is a program a program is a sequence of instructions often times uh, i when i ask this the meaning of a program people mention it's a a program is a set of instructions that is wrong because set can be rearranged and it would not be the same program so the correct definition is a program is a sequence of instructions therefore what is an instruction an instruction is the lowest level atomic command atomic command that a processor understands what does an instruction consist of it consists of two things the first part of the instruction is called the opcode this indicates the basic operation that the instruction is going to perform and the second part is the operand meaning what is it going to work on for example an opcode could be to perform an addition and so the opcode refers to add operand is what is it going to add is it going to add two numbers how are the two numbers specified are the two numbers part of are uh, stored in two registers or the format could be add r1 comma r2 comma r3 if it is of the first type it means that r1 gets the value of r1 plus r2 and in the second type it could mean that r1 gets the value of r2 plus r3 whether it is of the first type or second type would have a lot of bearing on the size of the instruction but needless to say the operation to perf be for performed is uh, described as the opcode and the operation to be performed on what numbers is the operand part of the instruction and this is where things uh, can uh, take large variety lead to different types of uh, instruction set architecture and before we go to that let me uh, also classify the instructions the types of instructions broadly can be classified in four types of instructions the first instruction refers to what is called as data transfer instructions as the name suggests these instructions deal with moving data from one storage location to another storage location in a microprocessor or in a computer system what are these locations these locations are could be registers they could be memory and they could be ports and so you would want to move data between these entities so instructions that move data between two registers would be uh, available instructions that move data between registers and a memory location would also be available instructions that move data between register and port would also be available and if we look at other combinations you may expect that instructions to move data between memory location and a port may also be available 
but if you consider this act this requirement memory is outside the cpu the port is outside the cpu why would you want to involve a microprocessor or the cpu in this transfer it is only going to slow it down because the microprocessor is not adding any value to this activity it will have to do this transfer in two steps one it will have to first read the uh, content of the port and then read the content of the port into a register and from the register it may move the content to a memory location and therefore this is a slow process and usually there are no instructions to perform this operation but this is a very desirable operation and therefore most of the time this is available as a hardware feature of the processor and it is called direct memory access. Apart from moving data between these entities, sometimes you would like to initialize the register with a immediate value or a literal value. For example, you want to initialize a register with some known constant or something like that. So you would have instructions to support this kind of transfer. Uh, then the other type of instruction would be for what is called as math and logic. And this would in, uh, include instructions such as add, subtract, maybe multiply, divide, uh, bit uh, uh, operations such as and so you are going to and and the bits of two operands or you may want to or or other similar uh, logical operations then the third type of instructions are what are called as branch Branch instructions are those instructions which change the sequence of instructions being executed. Normally the microprocessor or the uh, microcontroller fetches the contents of a memory location. After it executes it, completes it, it goes to the next sequential memory location and so on and so forth. But once in a while you may want to alter this sequence. You may want to jump to an arbitrary location. Why? Because maybe at that ar arbitrary location you have stored a subroutine that you would like to execute. So the instructions of such nature where the control of the uh, microprocessor is altered from the current location to a unspecified or a different location which is not necessarily sequential, such instructions are called branch instructions. What are the types of instructions? So you would like to jump to a arbitrary location, a, no, a particular location. You may want to jump it without any condition or you may want to involve a condition. Maybe there are uh, things like flags in the microprocessor. So you would like to jump if the if a certain flag is uh, set or you may want to jump to a location if this flag is reset. Similarly, you may want to call a subroutine. So that instruction is called call. Again, call could, could be unconditional or it could be based on certain uh, flags. Similarly, for call, Corresponding to call once you have once you have jumped to that uh, subroutine address after you have finished uh, uh, executing that subroutine you would want to resume and come back to the main program from where you had called this subroutine. So you would have instructions for return and again return instructions could be unconditional or they could also be conditional. Apart from this any other instruction that you may have would be in this fourth category and I call them miscellaneous instructions. And one very common instruction that is available across all microprocessor platforms is called NOP, that is no operation. It is usually to, uh, uh, if I want to use the word waste time or to spend time, there could be an instruction to change the uh, operating mode of the processor. Maybe to, you want to switch to a low operating mode or it may want to modify certain flags for say interrupts. It may want to enable disable interrupts. So, Instructions of such nature, as you see, they do not uh, fall in the first three categories, would be classified under the miscellaneous categories. Now, these instructions, irrespective of the processor architecture, these are the four types of basic instructions that any processor has. Now, the another concept that is built into these instructions is called 
addressing modes we are going to talk in more detail about addressing modes but let me use this opportunity to give you a brief idea because it is required to explain the concept of uh, instruction set architecture addressing mode refers to the way in which for an instruction which has a given opcode how is the operand specified meaning if i want to add two numbers those two numbers could be available in two registers or two numbers could be such that one number is available in a register and the other number is in a memory location or one number could be in a register and the other number is a immediate number so these modify or these offer more variety in the basic instruction like add similarly you want to fetch you want to transfer data between two entities do you want to specify the address of the uh, location how do you specify the address of that location is it in another register or is it in a memory location are you specifying the address of that memory location completely as part of the instruction or you are saying no use the contents of another register to go into the memory based on the contents of so you are using a register as a pointer or you are adding an offset to that pointer to the basic data transfer instruction you can create more varieties by the help of the this concept called addressing modes and because of which the total number of instructions that are available in a given architecture uh, microprocessor can increase or decrease and traditionally the number of instructions that uh, were available and now the number of instruction means not just the basic operations but the varieties uh, available with each basic operation uh, if you keep on adding more and more variety it would be called it would be classified as a complex instruction set computing architecture uh, earlier architectures were uh, of this uh, category uh, of this type cisc and then people figured that uh, large number of instructions don't necessarily improve the performance of the processor it is the same thing as there may be thousands of words in uh, the english language but most of the time you only use a very small subset of those words to convey uh, whatever you want to say most of the time and that argument led to the development of a uh, new architecture and this was called reduced instruction set architecture or reduced instruction set computing and in this architecture the number of varieties available for any given basic type of instruction was severely curtailed and it is not that architect processor designers can arbitrarily uh, choose to have more variety or less variety it has to be supported by the architecture the hardware of the microprocessor in terms of the available registers and the way uh, memory is accessed and so on but uh, to put on record this is another popular architecture the third architecture was when this uh, reduced instruction set architecture uh, 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 came into being uh, the designers of uh, cisc type of processor started borrowing ideas from risc architecture and uh, vice versa risc architecture uh, developers started borrowing ideas from cisc architecture and that probably angered certain purists and they said no we don't want to increase the number of instructions and they brought out a uh, new architecture which was called misc minimal instruction set computer unfortunately the number of uh, actual devices available in this family uh, probably one or two only this uh, idea died a quiet death and uh, one largely only hears about risc or cisc but there is one more architecture and that is called very large instruction word meaning that in a single instruction word you have several instructions so that it can improve uh, performance by parallelizing the execution so these are common instruction set architectures having gone through this it would be now uh, imperative to see what is available in the market since we are looking at microcontrollers we must know what are commonly available microcontrollers and based on this previous knowledge we can uh, see whether a particular uh, microcontroller is uh, uh, whether it is of sys type or risc type and so on and so forth so i'm going to class uh, list some of the uh, 
microcontroller available microcontrollers based on the number of data bits. So this is a list for uh, some popular 8-bit microcontrollers. One of the most popular and one of the oldest microcontroller families is the 8051 uh, from Intel. Although currently Intel does not uh, manufacture any microcontrollers in this family, it has outsourced, it has uh, licensed the technology to other manufacturers and more than 100 manufacturers worldwide uh, manufacture uh, integrated circuits microcontrollers based on this architecture and there are more than 1000 types of microcontrollers in this family. It is of a uh, CISC nature. Then we have a company called Microchip. It has a microcontroller family called PIC. That is a RISC architecture. It is also one of the very popular microcontrollers. Then we have Cypress Semiconductor. You may recall uh, me talking about the pro system on chip paradigm and they produce a microcontroller family called PSOC. This is our CISC uh, architecture, programmable system on chip. And then microchip, which acquired a company called Atmel, which produced a microcontroller family called AVR, which has more than 200 uh, chips in its uh, portfolio. It is of a RISC architecture and the very popular Arduino platform uses uh, AVR microcontrollers. So these are uh, top 8-bit uh, microcontroller devices. From 8-bit, people would uh, migrate perhaps to 16-bit devices and the available microcontrollers are our very own Texas Instruments MSP430, which we are going to use in this course. It is a 16-bit uh, architecture. Then we have Microchip has a 16-bit family called PIC24. It has ST10, which is a ST microelectronics offering. And NXP, which was previously uh, Motorola and then Freescale, has a HC12 and HC16 microcontrollers. From 16, you could have 24-bit architectures, but uh, there are not very many examples and usually people go to 32-bit devices. And we have 16-bit or 32-bit uh, ARM microcontrollers. ARM is one of the largest microcontroller uh, designers and they have thousands of variants. Incidentally, ARM does not manufacture the actual silicon uh, products. It licenses the technology to third party vendors who then integrate their own ideas of peripherals and create physical devices. In fact, Texas Instruments make uh, ARM var varieties of microcontrollers called Tiva. Uh, many other companies do that. And we also have the Intel's x86 family and uh, IBM's PowerPC. Uh, it is heavily used in telecom applications and earlier uh, Apple computers used to use PowerPC but more than 10-12 years ago they switched over to the Intel family and then uh, they became very very popular and successful. But these are the 32-bit uh, popular uh, microcontroller architectures. Having seen the available uh, uh, varieties in microcontrollers, it is now time to look at a modular approach to designing an embedded system. This is an approach that we have developed here at NSUT in the past few years. Uh, as the name suggests that it is possible to look at any embedded system design in the by way of few modules. So let us look at this. So we have created what we call as a six box model for embedded system design. Any embedded system application could be partitioned in six uh, boxes. Each box has a certain characteristics. Let us go through these uh, boxes. Uh, you have an input uh, block or input box which is which consists of devices where, through which a user would interact with the uh, would provide inputs to the embedded system. These are also devices through which the embedded system would acquire information regarding the environment, maybe sensors uh, and other devices. The inputs provided by the uh, input block are passed on to the microcontroller that is the embedded computer block. Then we will consider what types of embedded computers we have already seen how uh, they are implemented. The embedded computer uh, ac acquires the information from the input um, block, <coughs> processes this information and produces an output, processes this information by way of executing a program. So the embedded computer block has all the elements to execute that program, uh, meaning various types of memory uh, devices and then produces an output which may be uh, 
uh, for the user humans or it could be to actuate uh, certain controls uh, that are uh, described in the output block. Most of the embedded systems uh, applications would require at least these three blocks and the power supply block because without power supply it is not possible to run any electronic circuit. It may also certain embedded applications may require to communicate with the outside world and so you have a communication block and sometimes it may require to store data locally uh, beyond the capacity of the microcontroller. So, you would have maybe a hard disk or a, a serial uh, storage uh, device. It may also want to visualize that data in the form of connecting to a host and so the sixth block is a host and storage block and all these individual blocks are connected tied to the microcontroller or with each other using binding glue that I call as electronic glue and these are basically electronic circuits which are specific to a particular application and so we have not classified it as a box but it is dependent on a given application. Now what we are going to do is we are going to uh, dive deep into each of these blocks and see what are the available options, how do you uh, when you have a particular requirement uh, what all options you have. So the input block consists of uh, could be of user inputs for the user to provide uh, input to the embedded system and these are the various uh, options. You may have a push button or a toggle switch which is on and off. You could have a switch with multiple settings like you have on a fan uh, speed control, uh, low, medium, high and so on. These are called SPST or SPDT or multipole multi throw switches. You could have a matrix of switches. You could have a, a mechanism to interact with the system using a capacitive touch like I am doing with my pen here. You could have a resistive touch which used to be available on older uh, mobile phones. You could also use a read switch to interact with the system uh, using a magnet. These are the various options of interacting with the in, uh, embedded system for the user. Apart from that, uh, you may want to uh, record or you may want to uh, capture sound. And for sound you would uh, you could use a microphone or an ultrasonic sensor to uh, sense sound which is beyond the 20 kilohertz uh, range. You may also want to sense the magnetic field in some certain applications and the options are you could use a Hall effect. Yesterday in the last uh, one of the previous lectures I showed you this uh, uh, levitating doll project it used a Hall effect sensor. You could also use an inductor if the especially the magnetic field is of a varying nature an inductor is a good sensor to uh, sense the magnetic field. You could also use a read switch it is a binary uh, sensor meaning it will sense either the magnetic field is present or it is absent and you could also use a magnetometer. You could you may want to uh, read the distance to certain object so for that you may use the ultrasonic ranger you could use infrared proximity sensors. You may want to read the temperature of the environment and for that many many options are available. You could use a thermistor, you could use a RTD device, you could use a thermocouple or you could also use a semiconductor sensor. In fact, MSP430 microcontroller has on chip semiconductor based temperature sensor so that you could also sense the temperature of the chip. You may want to uh, uh, input information regarding ambient light and for that you could use a LDR and as you know uh, an LDR is uh, part of our inventory. We could use a photodiode. It turns out that even LED which is otherwise an output device that is uh, with which you can generate light, uh, LED can also be used to sense light. Then you may want to uh, input a strain and or force information and for that you have a strain gauge or a FSR uh, that is a force sensitive resistor. You could use a piezo sensitive uh, device, piezo sensor to measure strain and force. You may want to measure the relative position with uh, respect to certain object and for that you may use a shaft encoder which is usually used when you on your modern instruments like uh, an oscilloscope you when you are changing the voltage setting or the time setting uh, the knob that you are moving is actually connected to a shaft encoder or in your car stereo when you are changing the stations with the help of a, a tuning knob, a varying knob that knob is actually connected to a shaft encoder. You may you could also use a gyroscope 
or you could use an optocoupler. You could use linear potentiometers, potentiometers which have a knob where you move it up and down. And of course, you could use a GPS, which is a global positioning system. You may want to input image of uh, an input and this image is basically light arranged in either an array or in a straight line and for that you can use a C camera sensor or a linear CCD array. CCD stands for charge coupled device with this type of a, a image sensor and most importantly you may want to measure time and for that you could use some internal mechanism to count time or you could use a specialized device called real time clock for keeping track of time. These are all the not all, this is a uh, big list of uh, input devices that would go into the input block. Okay, apart from the input block, we have the output block and these are, this is the block through which the embed system outputs information to the user or to the environment and you may want to create light or you may want to control light for that you have an LED, you may have a RGB LED that is a LED with red, green and blue uh, together. You may have, you may want to control a laser or you may want to control a infrared LED like you would do in a TV remote. Uh, you may want to uh, provide visual information and for that you could use a 7 segment display and we, you know that we have a 7 segment display in our experiments uh, uh, inventory, components inventory. You may also have an alphanumeric display, you may use a LCD and we have a LCD in our inventory or you could use graphics LCD such as you have on mobile phones or you may want to output information on a television. You may want to generate sound and for that you would use a speaker or a buzzer or an ultrasound uh, generator so that it generates frequencies in the ultrasound domain. You may want to control the temperature and for that you have largely two devices. One is a heater, a resistor is a, a good way to generate heat. Uh, or you could have a Peltier module. The advantage of a Peltier module is that you can heat or cool the environment or at least one side of the uh, surface of the Peltier module. Then you have, you may want to control the position and for that you would use various types of motors such as a stepper motor, a DC motor, a servo motor and so on. You could also use a solenoid where you can move the, uh, the contacts uh, on and off. You may want to control the flow of liquids and gases and for that you would use a valve or a pump. You may want to provide haptic feedback to the user. This haptic feedback uh, happens on your mobile phone whenever you input device, it uh, vibrates a little bit that is a haptic feedback. And for that you use a vibration device which consists of a motor and asymmetric load. And you may want to output information in a printed form for which you may have a thermal pr printer or a dot matrix printer. These are some of the output uh, block components. Then you have the power supply block. For power supply, the first important thing to consider is what is the actual source of energy. Uh, are you getting it through the wall uh, outlet, uh, 220 volt or uh, 110 volts as the case may be. Uh, the energy from the source of energy may be uh, sporadic, it may not be uh, stable and so you may want to, you have to consider a regulator. Regulators are of two types, linear or switching regulators. Then if you are going to use a switching regulator, what type of uh, regulator? There are three broad types called buck, boost and buck boost. Are you going to use, uh, are you going to need batteries in your application because the input source is sporadic and you want to perform, your system wants to operate during those times where the input energy may not be available and then they, therefore you create a battery backup. Or are you going to use a supercapacitor to store energy during times when the main source of energy is not available? All these uh, considerations go into the design of the power supply block. Then you want to consider various ways of communicating with the outside world. Broadly, these are of two types, inter-device and intra-device. Inter-device means within the device, if certain components want to communicate with each other for sharing information, what are the various protocols available or intra device, oh that is the inter device between two devices and intra device means uh, communication within a given uh, like a television within the given system would be classified as intra device communication protocols and for intra device we have a UART, uh, SPI and I square C bus 
for inter device we have several uh, protocols such as uh, UART, local internet, uh, interconnect network, we have uh, control area network, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, USB and Bluetooth. These are some of the uh, inter device communication protocols. Then we have the uh, host and storage block where we may have a uh, device to store information and you could use a serial e square prom or you could use a SD card. Then we have the electronic glue which connects to all these uh, devices and what are examples of electronic glue? You may require amplifiers, you may require filters as the case may be or for the output you may require to switch high amounts of large amount of voltages or currents for that we have three types of drivers one is called low side driver high side driver and a both sides uh, switching device which we will consider in detail in subsequent uh, lectures so here we are at the end of uh, uh, this current lecture where we have uh, seen the various parameters in choosing the microcontroller appropriate for a given application uh, through time to market and cost considerations then we have seen the classification of microcontrollers based on the way it uh, communicates with talks to memory, the way the number of bits are uh, available and the instruction set architecture and we have introduced to the idea of visualizing an embed system through six blocks and we will go in further detail into each of these blocks in subsequent lectures. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed this uh, pro this lecture as much as I did in presenting it to you. I will see you very soon. Thank you very much.